Good evening, everyone. Happy Feast Day of St. Matthew. I hope you all had a wonderful summer. It feels like we were just here, but a few months ago at this point now. And we hope you are all having a very smooth start to the school year as well. Uh, we are really thrilled again to welcome you to our fourth season of the Mother Divine Grace School Light of the Faith series, in which we aim to provide a Catholic formation for classical educators. My name is Christopher Sebastian. I'm your host today, as well as the Director of Advancement for MODG. And as always, I am so pleased to be joined by Laura Berquist, the future director of this series and the founder of our school. As many of you know, through the Light of the Faith series, we highlight amazing speakers related to our school community who delve into topics that help shed light onto the astounding depth of our Catholic faith and how it pertains to our daily lives. Our theme for this year is Catholic life. As Catholics involved in education, we know that being Catholic affects every part of our lives. As Laura says, you breathe differently because you are Catholic. It should show. So throughout this year, we'll be focusing on different areas of our lives and how Catholicism can be a guiding light for all of us. Today, to kick off the season, we are so pleased to have Laura Berquist as our speaker tonight. <laughs> Although she needs no introduction, I will do my very best attempt now. <laughs> Laura Berquist is the author of the best-selling book on homeschooling, Designing Your Own Classical Curriculum, from which Principles Mother Divine Grace School was founded in 1995. For almost 40 years, Laura has committed herself to home education, founding MODG 28 years ago, and homeschooling her own children previously, an accomplishment that I know ranks highest on her own list of honors and joys. Mrs. Berquist has inspired thousands of families, my own included, to shape their children in the truth, both inside and outside of MODG. Our own school has sent forth over 10,000 graduates into the world, armed with the art of thinking, thanks in large part to her own personal efforts. It's at this point that I'll stop because I know that her humility is begging me too. <laughs> but I know that many of you have been directly affected by Laura's words, and I am so glad that you are here today to hear more of her wisdom. Tonight, Mrs. Berkowitz will be speaking with us about the beauty of homeschooling and what I know will be a very fitting start to our year-long discussion of Catholic life and a very motivational way to start off the school year for us all. Thank you so much for joining us, Laura. And would you be able to lead us in prayer to get started? We can do that. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Mother of divine grace, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, so 
I am so happy to be here to talk to you about homeschooling. As you know, <laughs> I believe in homeschooling. In fact, I love homeschooling. I've loved it for 38 years, 23 while I was homeschooling my own children and 28 working with the lovely families in Mother of Divine Grace School. However, I know from personal experience that homeschoolers can get tired. There were plenty of opportunities in my years of homeschooling to get tired. I also know that there are bad days for all of us when all one really wants to do is take a nap. There are times when tiredness and worry can cause us to snap at our children and even at our spouses. Nevertheless, I also know the joy we experience when working with our own children whom we love so much and seeing them grow academically and spiritually. I know the satisfaction of, even when things go wrong, and sometimes they do, even in major ways, saying, I did the best for my family. I want to put homeschooling in context for you here at the beginning of the school year. And thinking about doing that, the thing that popped into my head was homeschooling is beautiful. Now, it might not be the first thing to pop into your head. Right? You might think, listen, Laura, you obviously don't know what beauty is. A picture can be beautiful or a statue or a piece of music. We even say that a person is beautiful when he or she is good, not only when he or she is externally beautiful, but how is homeschooling beautiful? <laughs> and I can see that point of view. But think about this. Even in that list of beautiful things I just gave, beauty is not said in the same way about all of the items. So bear with me and let's think together about what beauty is so that we can see how homeschooling is beautiful. It would be easy to say that the people who homeschool are beautiful, at least the people I talk to on a regular basis, some of whom are here. They have beautiful souls. But even there, to explain how to say that a soul, which is immaterial, and a picture, which is material, can both rightly be called beautiful, requires thinking about the meaning of beauty. And that is worth doing. For one thing, those of us who have been homeschooling for many years can benefit from reflecting on the goodness, which is one aspect of the beautiful, of what we have undertaken. And those who are new to homeschooling or are thinking about homeschooling for the first time should see how important homeschooling is. So I hope to talk about those things today. St. Thomas Aquinas is wonderfully clear. When a question like, what is beauty, <laughs> comes up, St. Thomas, Thomas is the first person I go to for an answer. So that is what I did when I was thinking about how to explain that homeschooling is beautiful, properly beautiful. So in question 39, article eight of the Prima Pars, which is part of a discussion of the Trinity, St. Thomas defines beauty in terms of three qualities, integrity, due proportion or harmony and clarity. So let's think about those three qualities first with respect to something that we're used to thinking of as beautiful. Consider a statue. If all the parts of the statue are there, the statue has integrity. If the nose is missing, the statue won't have integrity and will be lacking beauty by reason of that fact. The rest of the statue might be beautiful, but the whole will not be. It will be lacking. So one quality of beauty is that everything that should be there is there. Now, if the nose is present, but too long, the statue would lack proportion and would not be beautiful on that account. If the statue's parts are in the right proportions, it is said to have the quality of due proportion. St. Thomas says that both of these things are necessary for beauty. Okay, so both due proportion and integrity or wholeness or completeness. I think those two qualities are pretty easy to understand. Clarity, the third criteria for beauty, is a bit harder. A statue is said to have clarity when it is distinct 
and its structure is apparent. So the quality of clarity belongs to an object when the object is clear and also when it makes something clear that wasn't before. For example, a landscape painting is not only a faithful reproduction of the landscape, in that painting, you see through the eyes of the artist, right? He's showing you what he sees in a particular way. And because he's an artist, he may well see it better than you would without his help. So he's revealing something more about the thing he is showing you. In the book, The Classic Point of View by Kenyon Cox, which is a really interesting book on art appreciation, Mr. Cox points out that the Impressionists made light their subject and sacrificed clarity and the structure of the objects in order to glorify the light. He contrasts this to Leonardo da Vinci, who was very aware of the behavior and effect of light, but chose not to represent it exactly as it In Kenyon Cox's book, there's this, a passage that I think is worth examining for us to get a better idea of the notion of clarity. So this is from the text, right? There are several long passages among his, that is Leonardo's notes, describing the effects of foliage as seen by transmitted and reflected light in which the blue surface lights, the yellowness of transparent leaves seen from below and the modeling of these leaves by the shadow of other leaves which come between them and the sun are considered with great particularity. But then comes this warning, never represent leaves as though transparent in the sun because they are always indistinct. And again, he says, the structure of such a leaf is indistinct and the imitation of it is to be avoided. There speaks the true classic spirit. The structure is indistinct and no amount of illusion will compensate to the true classicist for the lack of clarity and the lack of structure. So that's all from that text. So at least to two artists, Kenyon Cox, who is an artist in his own right. So he wrote this book on art appreciation, but he's also an artist and his work is found in the Library of Congress. There's a freeze kind of around the top of the first room you go into, that's all Kenyon Cox. He did other things too, but that's one I've seen. Um, so at least to him, Cox and da Vinci, the notion of clarity involves making the object distinct and revealing, revealing the structure. That makes sense in terms of the ordinary understanding of beauty. If the parts are not distinct, the object can't be seen, and then the beauty of the statue would not be apparent. I think it would be like having everything about the statue be slightly smudged. So what I wanna do now is take these qualities of the beautiful and see how they apply to homeschooling. So first, let's talk about integrity. To have integrity or wholeness, right? Homeschooling will be complete, to lack nothing that ought to be there. So how do we decide what should be there, right? Well, homeschooling is a method of formation, academic and spiritual formation for children that takes place within the family unit. So to have integrity, it seems to me that one should see academic formation and spiritual formation, and one should see them in the context of the family. That is, the fact that they take place within the family should make them be what they are and make them different from formation occurring outside the family. As regards academic formation, it is my experience and my judgment that ordinarily the best, easiest, most successful, and most pleasant way to educate school-aged children is to homeschool them. Their education is better because they actually learn what they learn. They don't go on to the next step until they've mastered this one. That's clearly an advantage for younger students. It continues to be an advantage for older students. 
such a student becomes accustomed to thinking logically, clearly seeing the next step and being able to articulate it. His teacher, his mother, <laughs> may not be an expert in her field, right? But she knows when a sentence makes sense and when it doesn't. And she holds her student accountable for that. She may not have mastered calculus, but she can make sure her student is getting his algebra lessons right. And if he's not, then he has to redo them until he does. If the student needs more help and his parents aren't able to give it, there are learning support classes or teacher services in Mother Vine Grove. There are local co-ops or community college classes available. A friend of mine once said, that she regarded herself as the general contractor of her children's education. She did directly what she could and contracted out those items that she needed help with. It's clear that home educated children do as well as, and in many cases better than, their traditionally educated counterparts on the ACT and the SAT college entrance tests. A few years ago, um, in 2022, Dr. Brian Ray, did a national study of homeschooled children based on the CLT data that was really interesting and informative. According to Dr. Ray, results showed that in an adjusted total score, homeschooled students scored significantly better, higher, right, than students from public, charter, and private schools. In an earlier study, Dr. Ray compared standardized test results from homeschoolers and public schoolers. Less surprisingly, homeschoolers typically scored 15 to 30% higher than public school students on standardized tests. The average score for a homeschooler in that study ranged between 85%, 87%, while public schoolers scored around 50%. I believe that this is because, though they may not have had AP classes, the homeschoolers have actually mastered what they learned. And Dr. Ray's website's worth looking at. Um, it's, uh, you know, www.nheri.org. And then he has a bunch of resources there. He's done a number of studies and he, he uh, cites other people's studies too. There's another ingredient in the success that homeschoolers experience. Homeschooled children are so much more likely to become active learners, self-movers in their education. Our goal in education is to form children in such a way that they learn how to think. We couldn't hope to teach all the information and all the subjects. There's too much. But that doesn't matter if we teach our children how to learn for themselves. Homeschooled children are much more likely to accomplish this because they're active in their own education from the beginning. Many of you have heard my, I think, funny story about a friend of mine who sent her 10th grader to school after homeschooling him for five years. <laughs> and she waited around, you know, like, how was he going to deal with it? What, what, what was he going to think, right? And um, he didn't say much. He went to school and he came back. After about a week, she said to him, so, honey, how is it? And he said, I love it. <laughs> She was like, both glad and sad, of course. She said, oh, why? He said, it's so easy. I don't have to think. They tell you everything. <laughs> right? They explain the math lesson. You don't have to figure it out. And then they do problems on the board. And so you can just, you know, copy that down. And then they give you some problems to do. And, um, then, then the teacher walks around the room and checks your work and helps you out. <laughs> so he said, I just love it. I just love it. I never had it so easy in your school, Ma. <laughs> right? And that's true, right? Because we expect our children to do what they can. But we help them when they need help. But they become active learners, especially if there are a number of siblings, because um, <laughs> they want to get done, right? Additionally, the homeschooled child generally has a better curriculum because it's put together by one intelligent, name, intelligence, namely yours, right? So that it's truly integrated. It is chosen with this particular student in mind. Now, most of us use some curriculum provider like Mother of Divine Grace, but it's the mom who retains the mom and dad 
okay, mom and dad, definitely Chris, mom and dad, but who retains the final decisions about courses and course content. In a standard school, the curricula for the various courses tend to be chosen without reference to the other courses. A particular text for a course is chosen by the teacher or by a board deemed to have the most expertise in this area. And you know, that's not unreasonable, right? But what if the decision maker doesn't have the same expertise in other areas and chooses materials that contradict the syllabus of another course? The student in that case will be left with the sense that truth is relative or at least obscure. I'm glad that test scores back up my understanding belief statements that the homeschooled child receives a better education. But I would think it was true even if the scores didn't reflect the difference because education is finally about good intellectual judgment. Homeschooled children develop their understanding of foundational principles in each field and they're required to apply those principles in every subject consistently. For example, they learn the fundamentals of algebra and in every lesson, they are responsible for bringing those principles to bear. No one else is going to bail them out by giving them the answer if they don't know. They learn how to construct a sentence and in every subject, they are held to that knowledge. If the sentences don't parse, they have to be redone until they do. I know that's a better system for developing intellectual judgment than any other. Now, you can see that this academic formation is what it is because it takes place in the family. So it seems to me that homeschooling has integrity in terms of academic formation. There's also spiritual formation to consider. And first in this order, not necessarily most important, but first is the child's orientation to the common good. And on that ground, homeschooling is certainly beautiful. And I'd like to give you two instances from my own life. In homeschooling, the family is a whole. There is an orientation to the common good of the family by all the members. There's a common life, not a boarding house mentality where each person is only interested in his own good. Once when my children were pretty young, we had some relatives visiting, dinner time was approaching. And I suddenly realized what time it was, which did happen to me on occasion. Right? Oh, no, I said to my children, I need to get the house picked up and make the dinner. And there just isn't enough time. What am I going to do? Don't worry, mom. My eldest organizer said, we'll get things picked up and I'll set the table. You just worry about the dinner. And then she delegated chores. She was good at that. Everybody helped cheerfully and we were done in time. My visiting relative took me aside later and said to me, I'm going to homeschool. I was glad, but a little surprised because we hadn't talked much about homeschooling. She said, I don't know how to homeschool, but I'll do whatever it takes. I want my children to be that willing to help for the sake of the family. She said that she had recently been visiting elsewhere with a family whose children went to school. The children were pretty good. But if a situation arose where one or another member of the family needed help, the general response was too bad, but you know, that's your problem. I've got my own problems, right? Another instance of this orientation to the common good, one that made a big impression on me was the time my parents returned from a trip with a present for one of my children and not for any of the others. One of my boys was at that point in his life enamored of Zorro. He ran around the house in a cape, waving a sword all day long. <laughs> my parents had found a really great mask and they wanted to give it to my miniature Zorro. So my mom took me aside and asked, you know, is this going to be a problem for the other children? And I replied honestly that I didn't know, but that it was a great mask and I thought little Zorro should have it. <laughs> <laughs> so with some trepidation, my mom gave Zorro his mask. He was absolutely delighted, which I expected, but so were the other children. And I hadn't been so sure of that. They not only thanked grandma and grandpa at the time, but later each one of them said to me, mom, wasn't that great? Zorro is so happy. <laughs> it's wonderful. Frankly, what I thought was wonderful 
was their reaction. I have to tell you, I myself, when I was young, would have had a hard time not thinking and probably saying, but what about me? When children are in school, they have a harder time sustaining that orientation to the common good. One of my friends sent her adolescent boy to school. He was not working cheerfully at home and she was beginning to wonder if he was going to be able to get into college. So she sent him off to a local school. Two years later, I asked her what she thought about her decision. She said that if she had to make the same decision that day, she would make a different choice. Her son was working academically, but he had lost all interest in his family. He was only interested in himself, his private obligations, and his friends. Adolescents have a tendency to be selfish anyway, and in a standard school situation, they have to think about themselves almost exclusively. They have to think about getting their stuff together in the morning, getting themselves to class, getting their homework done when they get home. There isn't much room in there for family or indeed for anyone other than themselves. And they're developing habits that will make a lifelong difference. And we don't want them developing selfish habits. I have often thought that when people say that homeschooled children aren't living in the real world, they haven't reflected on what the real world is. Some time ago, I read a newspaper article about an innovative program put into practice in a public school in my area. Each student in the school had been assigned to a family group with a staff member as parent and a mixture of children from other grades as siblings. And this group would get together for 40 to 45 minutes per month. The idea, they said, was to give the students a sense of responsibility and create a climate of stewardship. The principal said he hoped that it would encourage younger students to look up to older students and to have older students take care of younger students. I thought the most telling part of the whole article was the last sentence. Special needs students and gate students are likewise assigned to families on a random basis, thus creating heterogeneous, heterogeneous families and a mini picture of the real world. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> our children, our homeschooled children are living in the real world. And it's a world that encourages responsibility, a sense of stewardship, and teaches them how to get along in a family. This is very important spiritually. Most people's real happiness in this world depends on a happy, charitable home life. Why we should think that sending children out of the home for most of their waking hours, for most of their formative years, is going to prepare them for the real adult world is beyond me. And it always has been. Even when I was a kid in school, I thought, this is weird, right? It seems to me, as it evidently does to that local public school principal I was just talking about, that happy family living provides an environment that teaches children how to live in a happy family. Further, such formation makes it easier for children to develop their relationship with God. As I mentioned, adolescents in school are forced to think about themselves almost exclusively. They haven't got time for anything other than their own concerns. They need to be away from the family most of the time. When they're at home, they have homework. Family chores and family time almost always disappear. This lack of time has an impact on other parts of life as well. From 1983 until my youngest child went to college, my family, that is my husband, myself, and any children still at home, attended daily mass together. In 1983, a close friend of ours developed brain cancer, of which he died two years later. When we heard about Norman's cancer, my husband decided that we were all going to go to mass together. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, we're all going to go to mass together every day to pray for him. We did. 
and life improved in so many ways. God bless Norman. <laughs> yeah, you know me. I have Kleenex this time. So we were up early every day. We got home from mass revitalized and ready to start the day's work. Our schooling improved significantly in large measure just because we got started earlier, though I think grace was even more a cause. Anyway, from that time, we started our homeschooling day by going to daily mass together. Throughout their school years, my children were able to receive our Lord in Holy Communion on a daily basis. This is a wonderful gift and something we could not have done if they had been in school. And look, I know not everyone can attend daily mass. You know, I know that. If the mass times are such that attending mass means that you can't get your schoolwork done, then you won't be able to go to mass on a daily basis. When you're schooling your children, you are serving God by doing that work well. And he won't appreciate neglect of your primary duty in his name. I get that. But the general point here is that when you're in charge of the schedule, you can arrange time for your children to spend with God. You can make a weekly holy hour with your son. You can make saying a daily rosary a priority for the whole family. These things are very hard to accomplish when your children are in school. And though they are important at every time of life, it is worth mentioning that they have a special importance for the adolescent child who's trying to work out his place in the world. If he works out his place relative to God, finding his position with respect to the rest of the world won't be so hard. Thus, I think we can say that homeschooling has the first of the elements of beauty, integrity. It provides academic formation and spiritual formation, and it does so within the context of the family. Further, that context makes each of these elements of formation be what they are and makes them different from formation occurring outside the family. So now let's consider due proportion. Does homeschooling have this quality? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> First, due proportion is often expressed as harmony. Now, in my house, and perhaps in yours, there are days that are not harmonious, <laughs> but the order that makes harmony possible is present. Each member of the family sees that he has a role and knows what that role calls for. We may not always live up to it, but knowing what the role is makes its actuality much more likely. These roles are simple to see. The parents are in authority with respect to the children. The father is the head of the family and the mother is the heart. So let's consider the implication in those statements. <clears throat> I'd like to consider fathers first. Fathers always have an extremely important role in homeschooling, however much they may or may not do on a daily basis in a class by class basis, right? Some fathers teach particular classes, some fathers do the bulk of the teaching, and many fathers do not teach in their homeschool at all. But every father is the head of his house, and he exercises his authority over the members of his household. In any community, there has to be one final source of judgment, one person who makes the decisions in the hard cases, one person who by nature or inclination or office is able to bear the burden of decision. And in the family, that person is the father. And we know that because of 1 Corinthians 5, right? Where it is told to us through scripture. Now, my husband always said that a man who doesn't listen to his wife is a fool <laughs> because women are better by nature at deliberation. But men are better at making judgments in large measure because they're willing to bear the burden of judgment and take the consequences of the decision. Whenever I was facing a decision that was about something important or even something not important but difficult for me, I would take it to my husband. I would lay out the problem. I would pick my time, by the way, <laughs> just saying. But I would lay out the problem to the best of my ability trying to give an even-handed accounting of the situation. And then I would ask for judgment, 
my husband might well not be aware of all the details of the problem until I laid them out, but he was much better than I was at what could be done. And he was willing to bear the burden of decision. That seems to me to be the hardest part of decision making. Have I made the right choice? Is this really what God wants me to do? I don't have it backfires. The final authority in the chain of command has to be willing to make the decision in the face of those questions. So I've always been pleased with St. Paul's admonition to wives. Wives, obey your husbands. I know that that can be hard for people. My mom told me she doesn't like it much, but I've actually always liked it because it seemed to me to be the easy end of the deal. If I obeyed my husband, I knew I was doing what God wanted me to the husband has to love his wife, which means, I think, to be responsible for her happiness. That's much harder. This teaching of the church doesn't mean that the father of the family is a master and the other members of the family are slaves. On the contrary, right? On the contrary, it means that the father of the family is called to serve the family, and he has the primary responsibility for the common good of the family. In practice, a husband should treat his wife as an equal under authority, which is what both Aristotle and St. Thomas say, something like the relationship between the owner of a company and the CEO. In homeschooling, the father has to be willing to make decisions when they're necessary. He has to be willing to enforce rules when they're necessary. He has to help make the rules and proclaim them so that the children understand that they come from the head of the family. Without this, it is really hard to homeschool. Now, mothers are the heart of the family. Women are ordinarily the chief culture bearers in society, and their role in the general formation of culture is of incalculable, though often underrated importance. This is especially, though not exclusively, true for mothers. A sign of this is that in the old code of canon law, in the section concerning marriages between Catholics and non-Catholics, it was preferred that in such a marriage, the mother should be the Catholic. I'm sure that was in recognition that it is mothers who usually form the children's fundamental understanding of reality, which is not to dismiss the role of the husband and father. It's essential to a child's education that his father be present and active and above all, that he should support and confirm what his wife does. But given his responsibilities outside the family, as well as within, he cannot give to his children the intensive and day-long attention that they need. For that, he has to rely on his wife, especially in the earlier years. I think that it is in terms of motherhood that we should first examine the role of women in the formation of culture, because ordinarily the greatest permanent impact a woman can have is on her own children. Most of us who homeschool do so for that reason. Homeschooling is a natural outgrowth of the ordinary role of the mother, because all mothers are teachers, just in virtue of being mothers. In homeschooling, that role is expanded and made easier, in my opinion. However, the first step in reclaiming the culture is to understand and acknowledge the tremendous importance of the role all mothers have, homeschooling or not. The culture we live in tends to think money is an indicator of success. A large salary is the sign that proclaims this person's work is important. We have to be countercultural. We have to see that it is persons not things which have the greatest innate and permanent value. Since that is the case, the formation of the soul must be the greatest work that can be done. A soul well-formed and living according to that formation will see God face to face. Nothing. <laughs> <It's> hopeless. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Nothing could be more important than that. We should live according to this truth ourselves. You know, I'm going to have a really hard time getting through the end of this, just telling you. Oh, well, we should live according to this truth ourselves. 
and we have to encourage and support others who want to live it as well. If more women were convinced of the importance of raising children, they would endeavor to stay home and raise their children and their husbands would encourage them in their desire. Homeschooling is one way to live the truth that there is no more important work than the formation of souls. But all mothers, homeschooling or not, are called to form their children and all mothers, as mothers, are doing a work of immense and lasting value. Since the parents are in authority over their children, they have the responsibility to see that their children are obedient. <laughs> they need to work on obedience as the first virtue. And one way to accomplish that is by example. There are other ways, such as insisting that the children do what they're told when they're told, rather than issuing orders and then forgetting to see that they're carried out. But today I would like briefly to call your attention to the importance of example. Obedience is cheerfully giving up your own will. It doesn't mean doing what you don't want to do necessarily, though that might be the case, right? It means doing what those in authority over you ask of you because they ask it. So, you know, you go to mass on Sunday out of obedience, right? That doesn't mean you don't wanna go. You probably wanna to go to mass more than you wanna do anything else, but you're still doing it in obedience, right? So you're doing it on Sundays anyway, because those in authority over you ask it of you and you're doing it because they ask it of you. Maybe also because you wanna go, but you get the idea. By extension, it means doing your daily duty because that's what God asks of you today. In the case of the homeschooling mom, doing her daily duty means getting up day after day, giving up her other inclinations on any given day for the sake of her children and their education. And sometimes that can be hard. I will never forget a mom in our program who called me up one day and said that she was gonna put all her kids in school because she wanted to redecorate her house. She was tired of teaching her children and she wanted to do something fun. And while I can understand that inclination, I didn't think that was the best reason to make that decision. For one thing, I didn't think it would provide her children with good example. And I do think that our willingness to get up day after day and teach reading and math, history and science and Latin provides a very important example for our children. It also has some unexpected benefits, at least in my experience. I have found both in my own life and through talking to others that there comes a time when, you know, like the honeymoon is over. At first, each day of your homeschooling adventure seems like an adventure, and then it begins to seem like a good but unexciting sort of car ride, right? And finally, sometimes it can turn into a difficult hike. But I encourage you, as I always do with the moms I've worked with, to stick with it as it describes your experience because you are, in my experience, just about to enter the very best part of your life. In my parish some years ago, we had a new priest assigned to the parish. He kept changing the words of the mass. It was just driving me crazy. He also made us, yeah, he made us sit down for the gospel one day. <laughs> so I was going to talk to him about it. And he said to me, look, you daily mass goers just get stuck in a rut. You are not even praying. You're just existing. <laughs> I'm trying to help you get back on track by making mass interesting. And I explained to him that he was actually making it impossible for me to pray. It's true that I knew the words of the mass by heart, but that didn't make them less moving. It made it possible for me to go beyond the surface, to really pray, because I didn't have to keep thinking, now where are we? What are we supposed to be doing? And that's what it's like with homeschooling. If you've gotten to a place in your schooling where you feel like it's drudgery, my advice is to hold on. You're just at the breakthrough stage where everything's going to get easier because it's going to be so much a part of you that you can get beyond the surface. You will have, before long, a well-ordered, peaceful mechanism that will run almost automatically. I think that it's like learning to waltz. You know, at first you have to think one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, right? But 
But then all of a sudden you don't, you know how to waltz, right? And the music just carries you through. You're listening to the music. You are not going one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. I think that's what homeschooling is like. The music carries you through. The first, you have to learn the steps and that means forming habits and that can be hard, but don't give up. I homeschooled for 23 years and I still loved it. I love spending time with my children. I loved seeing them develop. I really enjoyed their company. Homeschooling has, in my opinion, due proportion, harmony, because it encourages each member of the family to see that he has a role and he knows what that role calls for. One of the important aspects of the role of the mother is to enjoy her children. And that brings us to the last element of the beautiful, clarity. We said that clarity involves making the object distinct and revealing the structure. Homeschooling makes the object, the family in formation, clearer and reveals the true structure of the family. Clarity in homeschooling comes, I think, primarily from the parent's attitude. So I was mentioning drudgery a moment ago. Now, I do think in any formation of habits, there's a certain amount of drudgery, you know, and I encourage you to persevere through that, right? But I also think that excess drudgery can be overcome by attitude. Your attitude is communicated to your children. If you are cheerful, if you are interested in the subjects and in the children, if you are excited about learning, your children will be cheerful, interested, and excited. If you show how important you think this enterprise is by being there day after day, teaching and learning, your children will see how important their education is and how important they are. Remember that mom I mentioned a little while ago who wanted to put her kids in school so that she could have the fun of redecorating her house? I guarantee you, that the attitude she communicated to her children about homeschooling was not a pleasant attitude. And that would begin a vicious cycle. She didn't like it, so the children didn't like it, and that made her like it less. A different mom, who I talked to Lily, told me, on the other hand, that she had a great year one year, and that it was so much better than her last couple of years. I asked her, what made the difference, right? She said, in the last few years, I've been trying to do the minimum in school so that I could get on with my I made it clear to my children that my, work, my priorities were elsewhere. I would send them off to do their work on their own all the time, and I wouldn't check up on them. I wouldn't correct their work for weeks. The only assignments I really paid attention to were the ones that were going to be sent in. This year, I decided to make school my priority. I learned there's no substitute for a mother's presence. You know what? Because I have the children's cooperation, I'm getting more of the other things done as well. Besides, I'm enjoying the school and the children, and it's been a great year. What my friend did was provide clarity in her home school. By her actions, she made the nature and the importance of what she was doing to her children and to anyone who looked. This is the hard part. Okay. In the book, Holiness for Housewives, a book which I heartily recommend, Dom Herbert Van Zeller quotes G.K. Chesterton. Talking about the woman, right? Uh, the woman who is, who is educating her children. I cannot, with the utmost energy of imagination, conceive of the domesticity is called drudgery. The difficulty arises from a double meaning in the word. If drudgery means dreadfully hard work, I admit that the woman drudges in the home, as a man may drudge at the Cathedral of Amiens or drudge behind a gun at Trafalgar. But if it means that the hard work is more heavy, because it is trifling, colorless, and of small interest to the soul, then, as I say, I give it up. I do not know what the words mean. To be Queen Elizabeth within a definite area, deciding sales, banquets, 
labors, and holidays to be Whitley within a certain area, providing toys, books, cakes, and boots to be Aristotle within a certain area, teaching morals, manners, theology, and the hygiene. I can understand how this might exhaust the mind. But I cannot imagine how it could narrow it. How can it be a large career to tell other people's children about the rule of three and a small career to tell one's own children? <laughs> Oh, sorry. A small thing, I'm, sorry, I'm going to try again. How can it be a large career to tell other people's children about the book, The Rule of Three, and a small career to tell one's own children about the universe? How can it be broad to be the same thing to everyone and narrow <laughs> to be everything? I thought about taking this out, <laughs> you know, because um, I, and, and you guys have to understand, I do this even if I'm alone, right? It's not just because you're here. Read it to myself and I cry. <laughs> no. Okay. How can it be broad to be the same thing to everyone and narrow to be everything to someone? No. A woman's function is laborious, but because it is gigantic. not because it is minute. I will pity Mrs. Jones for the hugeness of her task. I will never pity her for its smallness. Our task as homeschooling mothers is to teach our children about reality. We do this with integrity, that is with a vision of their whole formation. We have due proportion in our enterprise for each member of the whole exercise a distinct and important role. And we do it with clarity for our children through our attitude, see the very real importance of learning, of spiritual formation and of the family. You can see that homeschooling is, even speaking formally, beautiful. Thank you. And thank you for putting up with me. Uh, I know I speak for all of us when I say that was not hard to put up with. Thank you, Laura, <laughs> Thanks, for your Jesus. for your authenticity yeah. and your uh, your care and commitment. Uh, that was beautiful. That was really beautiful. Um, I think we do have time for some some questions. Uh, a couple of questions, at least. Um, so far, everyone has just been saying this is just what they need to hear. So it's oh, so glad perfect for the start <laughs> oh, of the school glad. year. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so first, a, a question about that excellent quote that you were talking about, uh, the point about homeschooling being a natural outgrowth of the role of the mother as a teacher. Mm -hmm. So Rachel is asking, would you say that all women, with children or not, ought to seek opportunities to practice motherhood, quote unquote, mm -hmm. or the formation of souls? Is motherhood one universal expression? of what it is to be a woman. Mm -hmm. I mean, those might be two separate questions, but yeah, so, so yeah, what do you think? Related, yeah. yeah. So, so you know, I would say yes, right? I mean, um, when you think about what women do traditionally, and you know, that comes from something real in them, we're teachers, we're nurses, we're, we're um, uh, we're, you know, spiritual mothers, right? We, we, if we're cloistered, we're praying for other people. Now, you know, that doesn't mean um, that women can't do, um, I mean, women also, as it's natural that they run things, right? <laughs> they run households, right? That's natural. Um, so I wouldn't want to leave anybody with the impression that I thought, you know, um, you can only, you know, for, to be authentically yeah. a woman, you can only do something that's, yeah. uh, 
but we're all nurturing, you know, whatever role we're in, women are nurturing. That's what they are. So even if the woman is running something, she tends to be more nurturing than men. Yeah. And what I said in the talk is just true in my whole experience. My, and I'm getting older. I've had a lot of experience. Women don't like making decisions that are going to make people unhappy. We don't want to make people unhappy. Men are far more likely to not care, frankly. <laughs> right? You go to sleep easy at night. <laughs> not not <Yeah>. really. <laughs> so, you know, but, but that makes it good in that it's what Mark would always, my husband would always say men and women, I mean, not surprisingly, but they really work together well. Right. It, like that's why God put us together. And Com a complementariness. Complementarity on kind of every level. Yeah. And um, I do remember many times where you know, my friend Paula and I would be on the phone like, well, we, maybe we should do this. Well, I don't know. Well, you know, so and so is going to get really mad if we do that. Yeah, that's not good. Maybe we should try it this other way. Do you think that would help? No, I don't think that's going to help because that's going to make so and so mad. Um, like on and on. And Mark would step in and say, just say no. <laughs> <laughs> like oh yeah <laughs> right. it's a, it's an option it's on the table <laughs> right. yes <laughs> so but yeah that that's that's wonderful um another question here mm -hmm. um this is a bit more of the practical and uh this is from a, a mom who says that is their first year homeschooling that's wonderful. welcome congrats yeah, welcome exactly but my children are arguing and fighting so much more than they used to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It is yeah. difficult to attend to each child while teaching each subject. And I'm finding my children needy and hyper throughout the day. I understand. They, that. they also don't love being taught by me. Mm -hmm. I understand I, that too. I keep thinking that if they were in school, they would be happier and have a more structured and ordered life. So yes, that'll be important to talk about. Yeah. yeah. Save. I, I just want to tell you, yeah. whoever you are, because I did that, right? Before I started homeschooling, I had my kids in a school that I helped start. My mom thought I should homeschool, but I was like, I don't think I can do that, you know? So I helped start a school. And um, and we had two levels in the school. The third, we didn't have enough money to hire a third teacher. So I was teaching my third child at home. It was actually fun. My second child was not happy in the school. So I brought her home we brought her home, you know, Mark and I talked about it and decided that was better. So then I was teaching, uh, you know, kindergarten and first grade. We were having a good time. And um, so the, the, the following year, I decided to bring my older child home. So now I was teaching three. And at that point, they were first, second, and fifth. And um, what I learned was that, um, especially my older child, who had been in another learning situation for some years, right? She wasn't obedient and she didn't know how. And she did, yeah, I, I remember vividly, vividly, she was mad and she um, pushed back from the table and the chair fell over and she went stomping off down the hall and slammed the door. And um, I called my mom, I said, Right. And my mom said, well, Laura, I can't really tell you what to do, but I will tell you what not to do from my experience. She said, don't give in. Don't refuse to fight. Don't say you're going to, you know, um, don't try to make this smooth. She ne you need to confront it. She needs to learn to be obedient. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what? It made a huge difference just my mom saying that to me i put the phone down and i walked down the hall and like i don't know sometimes you know when you made up your mind i walked into that room and i said okay honey you're going back there you're picking up that chair and you're going to sit down and finish that i didn't scream at her but she could hear it in my voice she got up and did it which was so good i was so good but I, you know, my friend there who's saying that as it, you know, it's not working out so well. I think this is what I think. I think God is giving you an opportunity. That's what I think. You know, there is no easy way to raise children. There is no easy way to raise children. It's going to be hard no matter what you do. Mm -hmm. But I think God's giving you a chance to actually develop those real virtues of obedience and of family unity. And you haven't 
had that opportunity because they've been in this other environment where they weren't being obedient to you. Hopefully they were being obedient to the teacher, but you know, they weren't being obedient to you. And they weren't seeing their siblings as their community. They were seeing their classmates as their community. And now they're being given a chance to develop that more natural understanding of what that first community is. So look, I know that's hard, you know, like I'm not, I've been there. I know that's hard, but what I would say to you is persist. And, you know, if you're enrolled, talk to your consultant because we've all <laughs> had that experience. If you're not enrolled, you know, find some other homeschooling moms who've been doing this for a while because yeah. that's not going to be a surprise to anybody. I do also just want to tell you this. Um, I have, at the end of my family, I have two boys who are like best friends now, but when they were little, they fought. Enough so that there were days when I said, you go in the living room and you go in the family room and you may not leave. <laughs> Of course, they wanted to be together, right? Yeah. So um, they did learn. Yeah. If they fought, they were yep. separated. <laughs> That's good. That's yeah. our 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 two um, middle boys are like that sometimes too. I, I can imagine their yeah. favorite games right now are are pushing, and mm -hmm. um, <laughs> they have fun with it until they don't. <laughs> yes, I know. That's the thing. Yeah. Yeah. I know. So this and that I think is maybe the perfect way to end it. I, I want to say a bring a couple other things from what this lady was talking about and see if, if anything sparks your interest, Laura, too. Uh, she was talking about these first couple of weeks, like an emotional battle zone um, yeah. and doubting the choice because there is the option to send your children to school oh. and how it's hard not to gauge her choice on how the children behave. Mm -hmm. It seems right that especially at the beginning of starting a new habit, like you were saying, there is some drudgery. There is the nature of sacrifice here. And it is an emotional battle zone, especially if it's something that will be for the benefit of your family. Um, prayer can help with that, but yeah. that your family is under attack, both because of the absence of habits previously. And also the devil doesn't want strong families. No, it's right. It's yeah. just, weird. yeah, I agree with you. Great. Perfect. Uh, well, that's awesome. We could go on for this for a long time, but we're here at five uh, dinner time here on the on the West Coast. And thank you all for joining with us today. But yes, Melissa, one of our consultants says in the chat, the first few weeks are always hard. You have to be disciplined. And it's so, so true. But uh, let's let's close with a prayer. Yeah, Chris, can I just say please, something? please, Laura? Yeah, so may may I ask, do, do we think I mean, we have lots of vocations, the homeschoolers yeah. are Definitely. And um, to the so priesthood, long, yes. To yeah. Vocations to the priesthood thing. Um, uh, Bishop Barron said not so long ago that the people who are entering seminaries these days are the homeschoolers. Absolutely. I absolutely agree with that. And we, we have to update our statistics, but um, uh, anecdotally, we just had uh, a newly ordained priest, Father Patrick Rooney, uh, come and do a massive Thanksgiving here at our offices, or actually right in, in Laura's office, which is very beautiful. You can see we've got icons behind her. It was it was a very nice chapel. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and he said himself that that MODG was instrumental in his priesthood. Uh, I we just I believe posted on social media again his homily that he gave, um, and it is on our website too. You can you can search for that. Um, on our family site and also on the public site, but I strongly recommend people to look at that. And you can see an insight into the sort of student that we have and the sort of student within our school that is being called to the priesthood. Um, and there are many. We had a, a really excellent um, talk on vocations to our high school students. Um, and one of our uh, one of our alumni priests, Father Ryan Truss from the St. Louis Diocese was, was there as well. Yeah. Uh, Chantel, that's fantastic. A yeah, I, I, I Bernadette, it's nice to see you there. Um, th there's this lady with the baby and working around the baby is hard. And that sure. is- Yeah, go for it. That is hard, right? Uh, let me read the, do you want me to read the question yeah, real yeah, fast? Yeah, I do that, yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. So um, another first year homeschooler uh, who has a third grader and a fifth grader with an 11 month old on my hip. That's great. Uh, I'm finding working around the baby is the hardest part. Any tips? Also, how do you deal with naysayers? It is discouraging when the journey already seems daunting and scary. 
Yeah. So I want to say two things to that. The thing is, I mean, it is hard to work around a baby. That's just the case. I remember my good friend Linda Lyons once said, the baby's nap time is precious. Use it. You know, like everybody learned that when the baby went down to sleep, mom got to work. Um, and and you just you just have to persist through that. And you have to realize homeschooling is not school. You know, homeschooling is is home schooling. Yeah. So you have to be able to be flexible. You have to be able to move things around. But what you see is that academically and spiritually, the kids do better in the long run. So you don't worry that you don't, you know, like sometimes when people are just starting out homeschooling, they have this idea that we have to start at eight and we're going to have, you know, X amount of time for this subject and X amount of time for this subject and more like school. And that's just not how it works because you're working with a whole. So that's, that's the first thing I would say. Yeah. Um, Can I say one thing about that, Laura? Because yeah. I, was, it struck me when you were when you were speaking, because um, you were talking about how yes, when a student moves on, he's actually mastered it, and that is the difficult part that we have to remember as homeschooling parents to say yes, we have to put into the front of our mind that we only move on when the subject is mastered. Yeah. Don't feel like you need to be measuring up to a, a standard. Now there are standards that we have to have as a school. But um, don't worry about falling behind as the primary thing. Worry about learning the material rather than the subject that you are, uh, or the the length of the subject that you are going into. That's right. Yeah, that's really good advice. And then the other thing about the naysayers, I just want to tell you a little story, and then we probably should end. But um, so I have this friend. I have a lot of friends. <laughs> I've been doing this for a long time. I have this friend who's father-in-law was a very lovely, good man. And he was also the chief psychologist for the school district in which they lived. And so when they started to homeschool, <clears throat> he asked to speak to them. And he said to them, please don't do this. Please don't homeschool. I just don't want my grandchildren to be in my office, please. Which was really hard. If if he'd been a grumpy person, it might not have been so hard, but he was a lovely, yeah. serious Catholic man, right? So it was hard for my friend. And she said, yeah, that was difficult. But they had decided that this was the best thing for their family. So they went ahead and they homeschooled. And um, five years later, they'd been homeschooling through that time. Five years later, he again was there at their house and um, he again asked them to please come and talk to him separately. And my friend said her heart sank. <laughs> like, oh no. But um, they went into the room to talk to him. And he said, he really was a good man. He said, I just want you to know I was so wrong. <laughs> he said, That's the mark of a good man. He, he admitted to it. Yeah. I know. He said, um, I've watched your children grow up. I've watched this last five years. They are the best formed and the best behaved and the most Catholic yeah. of all of my grandchildren. And my hope now is that everyone else will homeschool. Yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. It is beautiful. Yeah. My own grandfather had a, had a similar experience too. He was a superintendent in, in the public school system. And it, that was a concern, he said, that he wanted, uh, he didn't want us to be not well adjusted, I suppose. Yes. And um, <laughs> we had a lot of conversations about that throughout the years. And, and actually the the last time that um, we golfed together before he passed away, he admitted, he said, I've come to see you don't wanna just throw the kids into the deep end and have them learn how to swim. They, they need to be um, shown what is the proper way first. And that context is different for different people. So it's, uh, it was good. I was, I was surprised he brought it up out of the blue. <laughs> That is really good, Chris. Yeah. yeah. Uh, can we maybe have one more question, Laura? Sure, um, sure. Cindy was asking, mm -hmm. and this is a more a stages of formation uh, mm -hmm. question, kind of. Uh, what do you do when your two children who did get along move into a new stage and all of a sudden deal with the opposite and don't get along? So moving into a new stage of development and uh, transition, how, does, how do you feel that that works for families? Mm hmm. Yeah, well, so, um, and Cindy, I mean, you know, we've talked about this, but I, I have many times over the years have had a mom call me and say, I think I ruined my child. Mm. 
<laughs> my child was so sweet and cheerful and willing to, you know, do whatever. And now they are so argumentative and, you know, and I mean, it is adolescence, right? Which hits different people at different times. You know, I used to think that it was going to be 16, but my own experience is that it happens earlier than that. Mm -hmm. um, but what I learned was that they're expressing something that is natural to them. The, the adolescent child has gotten to a point in his life when he really does want to know why. He wants to know why. And he um, will push until he gets a response that deals with the why. So he tends to become argumentative, but what he's doing is exercising this a uh, new stage of formation. So I many times likened it to the baby sitting on the, on you know, in the middle of the room where the, the books are all safe. They're just sitting there, right? On the, on the blanket. And then they start crawling. And then you have to move books out of the way. <laughs> it's like a whole new stage, right? That you have to adjust to. I think that's true about adolescence too. I think that the kids are they are naturally inclined to argument because that's the next natural stage of formation. And so what you do is provide them opportunities for argument. So, you know, speech and debate can be a helpful thing because it gives them opportunities for argument or, you know, Toastmasters to make an argument. Or what I've always said is, you know, that's why in our program, when the kids get to high school, we focus on those rhetorical ends, you know, if, so they are making an argument about whether um, the thing done was expedient or inexpedient, whether it was just or unjust, whether the people were praiseworthy or blameworthy, and they have to make an argument. And, you know, I came to that because I saw that that's what the kids were doing anyway, right? That's what they're interested in. They want to make an argument and they want to persuade you. So I think that's part of it, Cindy. Um, but I, yeah, I do also think that sometimes it's like I did with my two little boys and I'm separated. Yeah. <laughs> you know, sometimes it's like, you gotta learn. If you're gonna, if you're gonna be that way with each other, you can't be together. Yeah, yeah. And eventually growth will catch up, I'm sure too. <laughs> It's not forever. These are just stages. Yep. That was yeah. wonderful. Yep. So thank you all so much for being with us here today. Uh, we will be back next month on October 19th, and we'll send up some more information about our, our speaker at that point. Um, but thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, thank you all for being here and spending so much time with us. And uh, yes. please, of course, know of our prayers for you all as you progress through your school years. Um, at whatever stage you are in of homeschooling, whether it's the first year, the 15th year, the 23rd year. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, and please pray for our school and pray for all of our students. Um, we all need it now more than ever. And we, ever, and we are a community of Catholic educators. Um, and uh, I think this is a real testament to that. Uh, let's end in prayer. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And our Mother of Divine Grace. Pray for us. St. Matthew. Pray for us. All God's holy angels and saints. Pray for us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Laura. God bless you all. And we will talk to you all next week or next month. <laughs> <Goodbye>. <laughs> okay. God bless.